Well, for those of you already logged in, we're going to give people till 1230 before we get started, but thank you so much for joining and we'll be getting started in about a minute or two. So please be patient. Hiding. Once again, for those of you already logged in, thank you so much for joining us. We'll be starting in about 30 seconds uh, to make it as timely as possible. Okay, thank you all who have um, entered our webinar. This is coming from Carnegie Women's Health, uh, one of the offspring of Maternal Fetal Medicine Associates. Uh, mm -hmm. The three physicians here have been Carnegie Women's Health for about a year and a half. It's myself, Dr. Michael Silverstein, Dr. Stephanie Lamb, and Dr. Aaron Gottlieb. We see uh, women at all stages of life. We see uh, patients for contraception, for family planning, for office procedures, for mm -hmm. aesthetics, for hormone treatment, office hysteroscopy, a full litany of care from teen through menopause. Um, and uh, we strongly encourage you coming to see us. We're on 94th Street several blocks from the original practice on 90th Street. And we have office spots open and would love to see you here. Today's presentation is going to be on bioidentical hormone treatment. Uh, BioT is the company we use. They've been in business for a number of years and we're just going to give you an overview of what we do. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm Dr. Michael Silverstein. Uh, one of the generalists in the practice. I have a, a long history of education. I used to be a high school special ed teacher. I've taught residents and medical students and now I enjoy teaching my patients. Uh, Dr. Stephanie Lamb is also on the call and she'll tell you a little bit about herself. Uh, I'm Dr. Stephanie Lamb. Um, really nice to hopefully meet all of you. Uh, I have been also probably in practice for the last almost, almost 18 years. Uh, I am a generalist. I have a particular interest um, as myself entering into the age of uh, needing hormone replacement therapy, of um, talking about hormone replacement therapy, but I take care of women of all ages as well. And Dr. Aaron Gottlieb. Hi, I'm Erin Gottlieb. Um, I am happy that you're all joining us here today mm -hmm. and very excited to talk about uh, hormones and how they affect all of us. And I happen to love talking to women who are moving into a certain age, but I also love to talk to adolescents um, mm -hmm. and their parents um, as they are transitioning to becoming young adults. So. Uh, Welcome, and um, hormones affect every part of us every <laughs> single day, so it's Thank really you. an important topic. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see the, um, the slide tray that we're showing. I say the word tray because when I started presenting, we actually used slide trays. Um, hormone havoc is something that really affects women of all ages. It becomes uh, quite marked when you're uh, onset of menses, uh, but very often that uh, mends itself and does not uh, rear its head until often in the 30s or 40s. Uh, and we'll just go over very briefly what hormones are, what an imbalance might be, uh, what you need to know about hormones and uh, who do you believe when it comes to this? And, and we use academic sources. 
and what are your options? Uh, there are clearly other options than, than mm -hmm. muscling through. Essentially, hormones are the chemical messengers that are made by glands, and they control uh, the actions of cells of organs. They are the directors of your body. And essentially, it's a lock and key fashion. Um, you have to have the proper key to make the lock open and close. And the big question and the big uh, chicken and the egg question is, are we getting older because our hormones are changing or are our hormones changing because we're getting older? So a uh, classic example, 30s or 40s, uh, working, exercising, plus or minus children, fatigue, uh, a little gray zone in the afternoon, mood instability, flying off the handle a little bit more uh, than you might have in the past, tension, uh, midnight wake up, sometimes it's to go to the bathroom, sometimes it's just because you're wired, not remembering nearly as well as you may have been able to, more sadness, um, more difficulty focusing on complex tags. We call that extreme fatigue brain fog. Uh, that's sort of the, the generic term. Hot flashes can affect women of many different ages, breaking into a sweat, soaking through your clothing. Sometimes it happens at night. Uh, many women may notice that they're a few pounds heavier on an annual or every couple of years basis, joint pain with exercise, bladder symptoms, uh, sometimes more frequent urination, sometimes urinary loss, uh, migraines, uh, headaches, uh, decreased interest um, in sex, uh, and sometimes uh, inability or a decreased ability to enjoy sex. Um, the BioT method, they've been around for about 15 years, although the hormone treatment's been around for probably between 50 and 100 years. And the goal is to balance testosterone, estrogen, and thyroid to optimize those deficiencies that we talked about on the previous slide. And it's all nutraceutical uh, as well to enhance the performance. Uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Gottlieb to talk to you a little bit about testosterone. Hi, thank you. Um, so we're gonna continue on the importance of, of hormones and testosterone is really a big hormone that gets very little play in the care of women. Um, I think it's really important to remember that both men and women produce testosterone and that almost every single organ, organ has testosterone receptors in it. So um, the appropriate amount of testosterone can really improve some of those major symptoms um, and concerns that Dr. Silverstein was talking about. Um, the difference between the testosterone in men and women is that men produce large amounts of testosterone and women produce smaller amounts. Uh, however, as we age, both men and women, uh, women's production of the testosterone decreases and women start to lose the production uh, around the age of 20 and by 40, they can lose up to 50% per year. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, I think it's really important to know the positive impact that testosterone can have on men and women. Um, I think everyone thinks routinely only about the benefit of enhancing libido and the, and the performance of sexual activity. However, it can um, a, a normal testosterone can help us feel energized and improve our over, overall sense of well-being. It can decrease the amount of depression and anxiety that we can have. It improves cognitive clarity and focus. Um, it decreases dementia. And it is really protective uh, to our brains, to our hearts, to muscle strength and bone strength, um, and, it, and to our metabolism. Uh, so those are all the positive effects. Um, and then it's, it's important, if we look at the next slide, to kind of think about where um, the testosterone gets produced. So in women, testosterone gets produced in the ovaries and the adrenal glands, and then there's some peripheral conversion from androgens. Uh, and as I said before, our levels of testosterone decline with age. And actually in women, half of the testosterone production decreases, and it actually decreases from the, our adrenal glands. Um, there is still some maintenance of production of testosterone within the ovaries, 
Um, and it's important to remember that women who have had surgery to remove their ovaries um, will have a significant decrease in that um, testosterone production. So why does um, testosterone get a bad reputation in women? And I think there are lots of myths about it. The number one being is that only, you know, uh, it's a male hormone and women only have it uh, to play a role in, in their sex drive and libido. Um, and if they have it other than that, it can cause them to become masculinized uh, where their throat, their, their voice deepens and they get male pattern baldness and it can affect their heart and liver damage and cause them to be super aggressive. These classic male, um, male characteristics. Um, and then always thinking about the risk of hormones and cancer. Uh, however, we do, um, we can debunk these myths by noting that um, hormone replacement therapy for testosterone is geared to optimizing the appropriate dose for our patients. And we don't ever want to give a woman a super therapeutic dose, which would then be giving her the male equivalent dose of testosterone. So in the appropriate dose for a woman, you're gonna get the appropriate response and you're not gonna get that masculinization. Um, the negative, of, the problem with having low testosterone levels for women is that it can increase their risk of developing dementia and Alzheimer's because a, an appropriate level of testosterone can make sure to block the amyloid um, plaques that can form in the brain. It can help with the prevention of cardiovascular disease by making sure that um, these, the muscles and the um, metabolic components are all appropriate. Um, because of the, uh, the regeneration of the bones from, from the um, testosterone receptors, we will get uh, an increase in the bone strength and that bone strength will make sure that we are less likely to have osteoporosis and associated morbidities like fractures. Um, again, testosterone has been shown to help with metabolic disorders. So it decreases the risk of developing that central obesity that a lot of women get and decreasing the risk of diabetes. Um, and because we know that testosterone is not responsive to breast tissue, it's protective to the breast tissue, we can assume that the, um, it may decrease the risk of, of breast cancer because it's not stimulating the breast tissue. Um, and if we, I'm gonna have Dr. Stephanie Lamb take over and talk a little bit about menopause. So I I think in general, some general facts about menopause, which for what, what patients are on the line right now and watching or future patients to come, uh, there's about 3,500 women who enter menopause daily. Um, average age of menopause here in the United States is probably around age 52. Um, and women will feel these um, potential changes and we'll go through what women may or may not feel uh, up to 15 years earlier as we get closer to the time of menopause, which typically we call the perimenopausal period, which is a couple of years before, uh, patients may start to notice increased symptoms. Um, and then eventually what we call the definition of menopause is one year without a period. Um, so about 3,500 women enter menopause daily. We talked about the fact that several years before these symptoms may start to increase. And several women, most women don't even know that these, um, they're gonna be affected more ways than they possibly realize. Stereotypically, we talk about what women may expect, um, sleep, mood, um, but you don't really know how it's gonna affect you until you start to go through your own changes. Um, most women do not even get over or get through menopause completely where they're completely asymptomatic. So once their periods stop um, and that one year of no periods and then there's a transition period, they may not feel well or normal, quote unquote, uh, for years and years and years to come. Uh, starting in the age of 20, going all the way through, like we said, average age of 52, will have some change in symptoms um, and hormone levels as they drop. Uh, we talked about some symptoms of testosterone, but in general, hormone production, um, as, the lower, as the levels drop, 
we will have low energy. Our mood may feel a little bit affected. Uh, women may start to exercise. They may eat the same way that they always did. They may even cut calories, but they just cannot find their weight budging. Um, Non-specific arthritis pain and joint pain for women. Um, and I can even feel it myself, hands, feet, you just feel off. Uh, difficulty sleeping at night, you may go down to sleep and then you are up at two or three in the morning. Um, we talk about that brain fog or inability to grab words or thoughts. Uh, this actually is a real thing. Um, and women may notice it for women who have had possibly children. You may have that feeling when you've had a kid or in the postpartum period. That feeling really does come back again in your 40s and 50s. Uh, decreased libido. Uh, as we as, as get older as women, we have just a decreased sex drive. And we may somewhat attribute that just to testosterone. But there really is a real interplay between all the hormones and how it affects how we feel sexually. Um, and risk of age-related illnesses. Um, I think Erin Aaron beautifully talked about osteoporosis, uh, sarcopenia, which is a loss of muscle mass. Um, and we just feel not as strong. Um, and these are all age-related issues. Um, why, why do we want to add hormones back um, and how to optimize it? Uh, Michael, if you could go back two seconds, um, the top part of that, you, you'll get a better fit from energy. You'll sleep better. You, you may be able to budge that weight that you feel a little bit more stubborn on, um, your sex drive or your desire for your partner may increase. Um, and certainly when we look at health related risks for us as women, as we get older, that breast disease, that bone disease and our heart protection for cardiovascular will improve. I'm all ready. Uh, facts about estrogen. Estrogen is the hormone that we predominantly think about when we look at women. Uh, it is present both in men and women. Um, and as opposed to testosterone, where the large amount of testosterone is for men and very small amounts in for women, uh, this kind of reverses. So estrogen, the large amounts obviously we find in women and very small amounts in men. Um, estrogen has so many different functions for women. Um, there's probably over 400 different things that estrogen can be applied to and we can benefit from. Uh, when we look at menopause in women and we know that our estrogen levels drop, women immediately start to notice uh, what we call hot flushes or change in body temperature. Um, women can obviously notice a difference in bone mass and bone density, which is why we do these screening bone density tests for women as we get older. Uh, it helps maintain memory and there's a lot of association with cognitive and neurodevelopment and prevention of brain function. Um, and it's great for collagen in your skin. And we as women, as we get older, uh, the elasticity of our skin may feel different. We may look in the mirror and feel less youthful. Um, and estrogen definitely helps with that. In general for estrogen as well, you know, it increases two hormones that specifically we associate with happy hormones. Um, and for women who notice that mood drop as we get a little bit older, uh, estrogen helps boost those hormones. And therefore we as women can feel a little bit more satiated and complete and just a little bit more even keeled. Um, positive effects specifically of natural estrogen and everything that we really do try to do here is about bioidenticals and really looking at specifically a hormone in its natural orientation and giving it back to you in the right amount. Um, and the benefits of estrogen specifically for women who have started to get hot flushes, you add back that estrogen, you're going to have a drop in these hot flushes. And to be perfectly honest, you may notice a big improvement in hot flushes within days. Uh, improvement in collagen in the skin, how it feels, how it looks, the texture, your mood, we'll talk about it again. Uh, there is definitely improvement in overall mood. Um, bone density, if you have a baseline bone density that shows an um, osteoporosis or osteopenia, um, you may notice some reversal and improvement in that. And for patients who start this earlier than that has kicked in, they will have an overall benefit specifically um, in their overall bone density and their strength. With regards to memory, uh, it helps maintain your memory. Um, and for all of those who are watching here today, uh, and I think many of us, and from the patients that I speak to in the office, this is probably one of the biggest things that they're suffering with. They just can't capture the words and they cannot remember just the way that they used to. Um, and there's a benefit specifically to estrogen and specifically neurodegenerative conditions such as Alzheimer's. From a cardiovascular perspective, um, and this is really a big deal for women, cardiovascular disease is probably one of the biggest health things that affect women in general. Uh, it does lower your cholesterol and it improves your good cholesterol, your HDL. It protects the bone. We keep hitting this over and over again, your bone, your breast, your brain, and your heart. 
all of which, and I can't think of four more important things that would be more important. Next slide. All right, so there are lots of different ways of getting hormones into the body, and there are lots of different hormones that we can use. The synthetic ones in the past have been pills, patches, and shots, and the bioidentical pill patches, creams, gels, and uh, we're gonna get to the topic of pellets in a moment. Um, when we did an extensive review in the 90s uh, with the Women's Health Initiative that came out uh, just under 20 years ago, uh, there was some very depressing news about hormone replacement therapy, but it was an extremely flawed study. There was not a well-balanced population studied. There was not a, a bioidentical progesterone that was used. And so there was some very daunting data that, uh, that came out of that study. Looking at patches, uh, there are absolutely uh, effective ways at passing along hormones uh, via patches. There are absorption issues. Uh, they need to be changed on a regular basis. Uh, some people don't absorb well through the skin. And so, as we'll mention in a few moments, there are peaks and troughs. In other words, there are sometimes fluctuations during the day or during the week where there's a little bit too much hormone being absorbed and others where there's uh, insufficient creams and gels, uh, sufficient uh, quantities used whether it's on the skin or in the vagina, uh, creams and gels are questionable about their absorption, uh, whether they can be passed along from onto your clothing or to people that you encounter. And it's also unclear whether aside from the perimenopausal symptoms, they have the same beneficial effects on the four things that Dr. Uh, Lamb il illustrated. For the testosterone effect, there really is no alternative to testosterone aside from um, uh, absorption under the skin, uh, either shots uh, or pellets. Uh, and again, we get back to the peaks and troughs, the shots to really, as a short acting medication, get an effective testosterone level, it might involve twice uh, daily injections. And if you miss an injection, inject too soon, inject too late, you're uh, once again up against the peaks and troughs. The pellets, again, uh, as we may have mentioned before, natural uh, plant-derived compounds, bioidentical hormone pellets, and they're the same exact molecular structure as your body's own hormones. And they last longer. They're placed under the skin. It's absorbed by a continual exposure to your capillaries, and they last between four and six months. Um, it's a relatively rapid onset and a fairly continual steady state rather than the peaks and troughs. Uh, and most important, uh, there are a series of labs that we obtain prior to calculating how much hormone you need and everybody gets an individualized uh, designed dosage. There's nothing you need to remember on a daily basis and you don't even know that the pellets are there. Pellets go back uh, 80 or 90 years uh, to women that have had hysterectomies. They've used estradiol, they've used testosterone. That goes back 70 years. There are multiple years of studies in the States as well as in other countries about pellets. And again, just in one slide, uh, here's a sort of summary on, on delivery. Uh, oral has to get absorbed by your intestines. If your intestines aren't working well because of a GI issue or a viral issue, you won't absorb it. Uh, with certain foods, it might block its absorption. Injectables is the discomfort of needing to stab yourself on a regular basis. We talked a little bit about the transdermal, the patches, the, the creams, uh, and possible transfer to others. And the pellets, again, consistent blood levels over time, uh, 24 to 48 hours of discomfort at the time of insertion, that's it. An exceedingly rare possibility of extruding the pellets shortly after insertion knock on wood, that hasn't happened in our practice so far, but we're equipped to deal with that if it does. And for the first three to four days, activity restriction for vigorous exercise. And then that's it for four or six months. And just a graphic on peaks and trough. This is what I was talking about in that uh, with the injection or the pill, you have a peak. 
and then over the course of hours or days, depending upon which you're using, there's a trough, and then there's a peak uh, with the with the oral. With the patch, it's a little bit less pronounced, but there's still uh, when it's due for placement, it's at a trough. It slowly builds up to the proper level. It may exceed the target level, then it slowly reaches the optimal level, then it goes back down. So again, a peak and a trough, perhaps not as profound. But then the implant, steady state. And, and so that's why patients tend to be most satisfied because they don't suffer from the peaks and troughs. Um, the BioT method of pellet therapy, effective, evidence-based, lots of studies, uh, several years of experience, um, no roller coaster effect as we discussed, often four months a year for women when we treat men, it's every six months, minimal side effect profile, optimal for bone density, no documented increase in breast cancer risk because it does not stimulate breast tissue, does not increase blood clots, heart attack or stroke, and may be actual protective to the breast, bones, brain, heart, and relationships, as Dr. Lamb uh, alluded to. I would certainly say, um, you know, going back a little bit to what Michael had talked about, that, you know, hormone replacement therapy, I think, had gotten a little bit of bad press, probably even when I first started um, in, in being a generalist in OBGYN. And I would certainly say the number one reason why people still are a little hesitant about replacing hormones uh, and the top three, if I had to say it over and over again, and this is just not a slide, this is real life, would be breast cancer, breast cancer, and breast cancer. Um, women are nervous and they believe that there's an association that if you add back estrogen, progesterone, or testosterone, you are gonna increase your risk of breast cancer. Shortly right after that, as far as the list of why people are, are um, concerned is, am I gonna gain weight? Am I gonna get fat? Um, and then last, I think obviously is the cardiovascular risk that if I add back testosterone um, specifically, a little bit less for the estrogen, am I gonna increase my risk of stroke or heart attack? Um, and you know, I specifically would also like to just re-jump on what Michael said, Eat everything that we do here, and I really do think that we try is a very thoughtful approach to the patient individualized care. We look at your height, your weight, your age, we do blood. Um, and we look at what your symptoms are. We look at your past history and we specifically are trying to adjust a dose for the individual patient. Um, and so the dose that would be right for me would not be right for Dr. Gottlieb and it would not be right for anyone else who's watching. Um, and so we specifically are trying to decrease any of these fears that patients may have and decrease the risks that obviously come out. Um, I'll take the next slide. Uh, so breast cancer facts, obviously we talked about that's the number one thing that I think comes up for most of us as OBGYNs. Um, am I gonna get breast cancer? Well, it's hard to, to walk away from the topic when breast cancer is the number one cancer that affects all women. Um, and you know, if, which is the reason why we are so here at, um, I think MFM Associates, Carnegie Women Health, um, and as OBGYNs in general, make sure that women are doing their screening mammographies. Um, and specifically, we make sure that we're screening women for breast cancer. So yes, it's the most common female fans cancer. Um, average age of breast cancer onset for women is probably around age 60 or 61. Uh, it is something that does obviously have a profound morbidity, although um, treatment is really unbelievably great um, and obviously identified early, but about 400,000 deaths annually worldwide. And most of these, obviously, if you look at the average age of menopause being age 52, 75% of these will occur in the postmenopausal women. 80% um, of these are hormone receptor positive, um, and for which depending upon treatment and adjuvant treatment given to women, there's a less than 2% recurrence after five years or within the five years of treatment. Uh, breast cancer studies, I mean, there's study after study, and there are hundreds of studies. Um, the take home essentially is this, when we look at both testosterone and estrogen. Um, testosterone delivered by pellets, and I think Dr. Gottlieb had really talked about this, specifically how the pellet uh, works and the testosterone that we're giving back to women does not work on the breast tissue. So it's not going to cause an increase in the production of breast tissue, and therefore does not, and I'll say it again, really should not and does not increase the risk of cancer, unlike the oral forms or the synthetics, the methyl testosterones. 
uh, treatment with the testosterone and the estradiol specifically um, does not increase your risk of breast cancer. Once again, there are different receptors. Um, and going forward, when we look at benefits of treatment for hormones, uh, we look at the number two thing, which obviously is osteoporosis. Um, when I look at people within my own family um, and how I practice medicine is obviously what I treat somebody, um, a patient, as well as my family members, I treat them the same. Osteoporosis is probably one of the biggest things that will affect women, meaning if they're healthy, but their bones are poor, if they fall and break a hip, this will probably one of the biggest things that will end up killing them, not cardiovascular disease and not breast cancer. Testosterone specifically is a bone builder. It's the thing that helps build up the strength in the bone itself. Um, and we know that there's probably about a fourfold increase in bone density um, over oral estrogen alone, and specifically two and a half times greater than the patches. So if you look at pellet therapy, there's about an 8% increase specifically for pellets. Once again, bioidentical pellets that are plant-based, about a three and a half percent for benefit for patches, which is pretty darn good. And a one to 2% chance for oral estrogen increase of bone health. Um, when we look at arthritis, uh, in general, 10 to, to about 10% of women will suffer with arthritis and specifically women about up to 20% of women will notice that there's some changes in the joints and arthritis in general. And um, of those women greater than six years of old, this is specifically, they'll have osteoarthritis. By 2020, and we're even beyond this, obviously this would be the fourth leading cause of disability for women. Um, and both estrogen and testosterone can stimulate these precartilage cells um, and so both together in a, in a perfect optimized kind of way, if we can get both patients on the estrogen and the testosterone to work in tandem, you're really gonna have an, an improved benefit and reversing some of the development of arthritic tissue. Um, Alzheimer's disease, I, I think the neurodegenerative diseases are scary for women. Um, and I think as all of us as women and women who are watching today, uh, keeping our brain health important and be able to just be on it is really probably one of the most important things. Um, and so women get Alzheimer's at a rate of about eight to, to one over men and women on estrogen specifically, and I think this is a powerful fact, have a 50% less chance of developing Alzheimer's disease. So specifically, if you have someone in your family who suffers or has Alzheimer's, you yourself should be more proactive and consider going on hormone replacement therapy. Um, and even if you don't have someone in your family with Alzheimer's disease, knowing a fact that there's a 50% less chance of developing Alzheimer's, I think is reason alone to consider it. Men with low testosterone, we know we're three and a half to three times more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. Um, and when we look at the men and women in tandem, we could see that there's certainly a benefit for hormone replacement therapy. Um, women hormones and the heart, uh, we talk about osteoporosis and bone benefit. Um, and we talked about the cardiovascular benefits specifically. I think I touched on just briefly um, improvement of the HDL, which is a, the, the good cholesterol and the overall lowering of your total testosterone, which is your you know, cholesterol in general. Estrogen replacement therapy, specifically with pellets, has a positive um, impact on body fat. Aaron, Dr. Gottlieb had talked about this, as well as overall improvement of lipids. And I think more than ever, um, and having practiced, and I think all of us together, women are taking better care of themselves than I think that they ever have. And women come into the office and want to know what they can do to optimize their health. Um, and specifically, that includes cardiovascular disease. And we work all the time with primary care doctors. There's a benefit for estrogen to decrease your total cholesterol and LDL, improve that good cholesterol, which is your HDL and the triglycerides, which we know negatively can impact cardiovascular disease. Um, adding testosterone back, which I think women in general had this negative um, thought that testosterone would uh, negatively impact their cardiovascular. It absolutely does not. There's probably a marked reduction in fat production in that central obesity that we talked about. Um, and many studies show the benefit of, of taking a natural testosterone on your body health. And for men, testosterone pellets um, do a very similar job for, for your lipids in lowering the total, lowering the harmful uh, cholesterol, uh, increasing the helpful um, cholesterol, and lowering triglycerides. Fat reduction, as, as uh, Steph Lamb just reviewed, improved lean body mass, as well as benefit, beneficial effects on the heart. 
And so men have a, an absolute uh, benefit from it. Um, temporary concerns of the first insertion, uh, very often that'd be some uh, fluid retention for several days, a swelling of the hands and feet, uh, women for breast tenderness, nipple sensitivity as they nipple sensitivity as they get exposed to hormones that they may have been deficient in, are for women getting menopausal estrogen. There often might be some uh, transient uh, vaginal bleeding. There might be mood instability, and as I discussed before, a pellet extrusion, a very rare uh, occurrence. A facial breakout from testosterone is often transient and with subsequent um, uh, replacements of the pellet, uh, dosages can be altered. Uh, men might have a testicular shrinkage because of the feedback of testosterone to their pituitary and reduction in sperm count. So this is not ideal for uh, couples that are planning uh, children soon. So I, I, we just wanna wrap up right now and kind of uh, review this process. It is very important to remember that a hormone imbalance can occur in men and women and at any age, and that there are many different types of therapies. And what we like to do here at Carnegie Women's Health is make sure that we find the right therapy and treatment for you and to optimize your hormones. Um, we have partnered with BioT because we find that uh, the pellets offer a slow release of hormones. So as Dr. Silverstein said, you're not getting this roller coaster ride. Um, and what we do is we have you come in, we see you, and if it's for your regular routine visit, we can address it at that point. Or if you want to come in and make um, a consult visit to talk about all of you know, the symptoms that you're having and the concerns that you're having from you know, your health history, mm -hmm. Um, we would talk about what's the most important thing for you. And then we would run a series of um, blood tests and figuring out, you know, is it your estrogen deficient, your testosterone deficient? Do you need some vitamin D or some, a B complex? Um, or is your thyroid not as optimized? And what we do is once we have all those results and we look at your biggest concerns, we can we can set up another consult. We can even do it virtually to kind of review and come up with an optimization plan for you. Um, and then we would bring you in if BioT, if this pellet therapy is something that is of interest to you, we'll bring you in um, and we will um, take care of it here in the office. It is a very short procedure um, and most people find it very comforting and it usually takes about uh, two weeks before you start to feel um, some improvement. And um, usually you only need to have these pellets done uh, every three to four times a year. Um, and so that's, you know, every three to four months. Um, and so that's kind of the BioT plan, but it also is really good to think about your hormones in general and how we can make sure that you are optimized and feeling your best. And as Dr. Lamb said, protecting your heart, your brain, your breasts, your, you know, your mood, all of those things are really important. And we are here for, to help and guide you in all of that. Um, so we thank you so much for this opportunity today. Um, and we have a few minutes, I think, to answer one or two questions. Um, so I'm gonna, let me just look at the Q and A. Um, Here's a question, so this is great. Uh, if I'm still on hormones to prevent pregnancy at age 52, when would be a good time to change to other types of hormones? I'm still having regular periods. Um, Dr. Lamb, do you wanna take that? Sure. So uh, as I had briefly mentioned around age 52 is probably the average age of menopause in the United States. Um, if you're currently on um, birth control pills, uh, potentially, if that's what you're alluding to, if you're taking a birth control pill at age 52, um, it's possible to do blood testing on the birth control pill. Um, and we can run that whole battery of tests, I think, that Dr. Gottlieb had showed on the screen before. Um, and if your FSH, which specifically is the hormone that reflects menopause, 
is elevated on the birth control, uh, it certainly will be a reflection that you are in perimenopause or if you stop the pill, it may go into menopause. Uh, we have lots of patients who transition from birth control pills um, and transition into hormone replacement therapy. Um, and so that's something that obviously we tailor and we would check your labs and kind of discuss with you as an individual basis. Um, but yes, you can at that age, depending upon what your FSH looks like and what your history is and family history, we could transition you into hormone replacement therapy. And it's also important to realize that the pellets are dramatically lower amounts of estrogen uh, than the birth control pills and women mm -hmm. in menopause don't need that high dosage that uh, menstruating women need to, to suppress their ovulation. I think, and also just to jump on that, um, when we look specifically at hormone replacement therapy, you know, birth control pills are synthetic. When we look at the bioidentical hormones that we're going to be adding back, uh, these are non-synthetic. So these are literally from plant-based um, sources. And so patients uh, should not feel a difference. Actually, if you've done well with the birth control pill, as far as symptoms go, you probably should not notice any new symptoms and those concerns that patients have with bloating and waking. Uh, if you've done beautifully with the pill, you would do just as beautifully with the bioidentical hormones. Anything you'll do better because it bypasses the effects of the liver and you can have some less systemic side effects um, that some of the synthetic hormones actually have. Um, another question just came in, is hormone supplementation contraindicated with autoimmune disorders like lupus? Uh, Dr. Silverstein, do you wanna take that? Yeah, there doesn't seem to be any, any uh, prevention of, uh, of uh, boosting hormones in patients with lupus. Uh, we feel very comfortable uh, stabilizing hormones in patients with many autoimmune disorders, and uh, you're certainly candidates for the hormone treatment. Yeah, I, and I think um, specifically also, uh, Michael, the, some patients with lupus, I think the rheumatologists or their, their physicians may be nervous, uh, specifically maybe for birth control or blood clotting and those type of things. Uh, these are medications, obviously, that you may take by mouth. Um, these are obviously pellets and medications that were bypassing the liver and once again, should not affect you with an autoimmune perspective. So I think we could also work in tandem and we, we often uh, reach out to plenty of your own physicians and we can uh, touch base with your own doctor before we start treatment just to confirm that it's really okay for you. I think that's a really important thing to remember is here we're, we're working to help you as the individual. And so if there is a concern that you're specifically having, we are happy to reach out to your other doctors um, and discuss things and make a management plan. We like, we, the three of us work as a team and we work with the larger team at maternal fetal medicine. Um, and so I think it's a really nice um, way to get individualized care um, for you specifically. Another question that just came in is from someone who has used estrogel and it caused a reaction uh, of dry mouth. Um, she wanted to know if bioidentical hormones can cause the same side effects. Um, so I don't know if anybody wants to jump in, but it is highly unlikely that mm -hmm. you would have dry mouth from the, from the, um, from the pelleting. Um, usually, again, it's, you're missing the whole GI and you're missing the topical. So you're not, you're getting, a, um, a continuous uh, release of hormones um, over time without having uh, specific effects from the distribution of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. Um, I, th I think that's all we probably have time for today. I don't see any more questions coming in. Um, is there, I, I mean, we really just want to thank you so much uh, for giving us this opportunity. We are happy to discuss things further one-on-one. -on -one. And also, if there are other topics that you would like us to discuss in the future for subsequent webinars, please reach out um, because we're here for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.